Hi, welcome to Flight Test, I'm Josh, and today we're going to be showing you how to build the FT Elements Thrust Vector Assembly. Now this assembly is great if you have a scratch build, you want thrust vectoring, also maybe even if you want to put a GoPro on the front of it. It's basically going to be coupled along with David's Vigan to give you excessive pitch control, or just to help you with your own scratch build design. But go ahead, if you haven't already, go ahead and order the little kit. We will have free uh, plans on the internet that you can jigsaw out and uh, scroll saw out, but if you, if you want this, it's available at the store as of right now. Go ahead and get some CA glue, your wire benders, and we'll get started. All right, our first step is to carefully go ahead and remove your pieces. A little wiggle should be all you need to pop it out. And if you have to, just go ahead and sand any extra flashing off if you have it. But it just pops right out very easily. And to begin with, we're going to concentrate on these main pieces right here. We can put the rest to the side at the moment. The first thing we're going to want to do, this is actually the front of your uh, motor mount that's going to be right behind the pivot. So go ahead and take your, your center piece, it's going to be the biggest and insert it right through the back. Hold off glue until we have all three of these pieces in alignment. Next will be the top plate, and the final is going to be the bottom. At this point we should be very happy with everything, but before we go ahead and lock it down, we want to go ahead and take out our largest diameter wire out of our small packs kit, right here. And with the twisting motion, go ahead and run it through all three pieces of your plywood. It should be just a touch snug we actually have to use a rotating motion. We don't want this to be sloppy. Simple twisting motion. Don't poke your finger. Just like that. The reason we want to do this is we want this to be nice and straight. Uh, if this is a little bit of slop here and it moves back and forth, you're not going to have a nice straight path to going through here. Now that we have that in, go ahead and go with some CA on the very back. And put a nice bead of CA on all your seams. Now that our supports are all glued in nice and firmly, go ahead and keep your wire through uh, throughout this whole process in there. Our next step is to fit our side cheek on. Now with the side cheek, you're going to want the tabbed end to go on the same side as the recessed part. You can put it in either way, but you're going to notice that it's not going to match up very nicely and nothing will fit together. Everything's keyed so it can only really go in one way, so you shouldn't get any issues with mixing it up. Let's just go ahead and do a trial fit. We're going to put it flat on the table and with a rocking motion, simply seat it in place. And everything should fit nice and snug and square naturally. Now because this is all glued in, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up and make sure you're happy with the fit. Don't rush this part. And on all the flats here, just to get the strongest glue joint possible, I'm going to go ahead and put a bead of glue on all the lower non-raised flats. Just like that. Once again with the notch paint pointing down, it'll only fit in one way. I'm going to press this down. And whenever you're doing assemblies like this, use the table as your friend. In other words, flip it over, and you can always take a piece of wax paper if you're really concerned about something not being right. Take a piece of wax paper and put it down so it doesn't glue onto the table. But as long as you don't go too crazy with the glue, you don't have to worry about that. But it's very easy to use tables to push up against and get your edges really square and true. It's much better than just pushing on one spot and having it, the whole thing pivot off. Now, if you're really worried about it, you can always go back and follow up with an extra little bead of glue. You don't really have to. Everything kind of locks and tabs into place naturally. There we go. Now, as you may have guessed it, we're going to see repeat the exact same process on the other side. Now, if you download the plans and you're jigsawing this out and these tabs intimidate you, as long as you have nice straight edges, you can do away with the tabs. You don't necessarily have to worry about that, but we will have the plans that you can download at the bottom of this article on flighttest.com. Our final main substantial piece in the body of the thrust vector unit is this little bottom plate here. And you're going to see this tab here. This tab is going to point forward towards the wire. And you'll see why in a moment. Once again, always test fit, dry. And you're going to notice as this thing is getting more and more assembled, there's more and more grooves, more and more fitting, but as long as you test fit everything and got it square, it's going to pop right in nice and snug. I'm happy with that. We're going to do the same thing. The lower recessed flats, I'm going to go ahead and put my glue down on. I'm using medium thickness CA glue. Some people even use hot glue on the plywood. It's totally up to you, but just keep in mind, if you use something with a thick viscosity like hot glue, you're not going to get that tight tolerance unless you're really good at slamming it down in quickly. So be careful with that. Once again, snap it into place. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flip this over, grab that rod in there, just press down with the palm of my hand, flat up against the table. If you're worried about it with the table, halfway through just kind of give it a little wiggle back and forth, keep the glue from touching it. 
The body of our thrust vector unit is now officially done. We're going to go ahead and put this aside and work on our main firewall unit. Now you're going to notice that this actual firewall is just a touch narrower than the main body. There's a reason for that. If you want left and right access, you're fine. You could have a wider body. But if you flipped it for the up and down access, what would happen is if it's too big, it would collide. And a lot of times this is going to be recessed a little bit into your fuselage. And you don't want to rub it against your foam or your building uh, or the glue surface of your plane. So that's why this is just a little bit shorter than what's needed. And as you can see, you go this way for right and left thrust, this way for up and down thrust, or you can do it this way. It's whatever you prefer. That's basically how you do it. You don't have to switch any linkages or anything. It's just which way you glue it on. For the firewall, you don't have to pick a specific side. They're both the exact same. Just pick one and stay with it. And this is where your wires are going to go through. Obviously, three holes, three tabs. It's going to go on the very top. Test fits good. Now in this case, I'm going to go ahead and put my glue on the actual firewall in between each spot. The reason I'm doing this, if I put this on the tabs, it's going to do nothing but force the tabs onto my building surface and I don't want that. There we are. Once I'm happy with the fit, everything's nice and flat. I can go back, put a little support bead of glue. More glue does not need mean more strength. A good tight fit is better than excess glue any day of the week. And if you want to use a little catalyst, kicker is what they call it, or accelerant, just a little spritz is all you need. Just keep in mind if you have your kicker soaking around the area like this tab, that's why I covered up with my finger, it'll actually cause the glue to dry quicker, so be careful about that. Final step is to glue this little tiny bottom pivot in. Now it's very important, most thrust vector units are pushers, so you don't usually have to worry too much in regards of will this thing fly apart because everything is getting pushed together. But you always want to make sure it's as strong as possible. If there's any issues, stop there and reinforce it. Make it right. What I can do here is I can just put a little bit of pressure down against the table. Make sure it's nice and flat. Now we're going to go ahead and I remove the, uh, the center pivot pin here. And I'm going to go ahead and just do a test fit. You shouldn't have any excess slop. It should fit nice and smoothly in between here if everything is built correctly. And that looks great. So we're going to put this aside and we need to bend a little bit of a bend, a 90 degree bend in this pin here. So what I'm going to do, simply about the width of my pliers, and make sure when I put the force here, I'm not bending all the way out here and putting a nice arc in here. Get it as close as possible to where you're bending it. And that's a good practice for whenever you're doing Z bends or any kind of bending. Don't bend it far away. Bend it as close as possible. If you have to, you can even use a table to get your bend. It's totally up to you. But the straighter you can keep the main portion of this rod, the better everything is going to work out. Now we have something that we can work with, and this is where that little pivot's going to come into play. I'm going to go ahead and with the twisting motion, start putting it through. And the hardest one is the very first one. Once you get the first one down, everything else just falls into place beautifully. Don't force things. If there's a reason why it's not going through, look for the reason why. There we are. And right through. And now this is the reason why we have this notch here is wheel collars are great, but not everyone has wheel collars, and it's really not needed in this step. All you need to simply do is if you have a sharp enough bend, let that sit right down in that little spot right there, and you can even use a table to help you out with that, like so. Now that's flash, or flat, we can take a little drop of hot glue and smear it right over top of it. It's going to be captive, and you don't ever have to worry about it again, but if you need to take it off, you can just heat it up or pick out the glue, slide it right out, and you're good to go again. Now if you wish, you take your pliers and cut this down just a little bit. Just make sure you don't shoot anyone in the eye. All right, we're going to take our smaller diameter wires now. We're going to put something called a modified Z-bend in it. It's actually one of the easiest bends to hand bend because you don't have to pivot. What we're going to do is we're going to first start off with the small leg, bend it 90 degrees, and then go in about an eighth of an inch and bend the next leg, just like this. A lot of other people also have these handy little gizmos here. They actually put Z-bends in here. This is a common tool that a lot of modelers have. All you can do if you want to simply make a modified Z-bend is do your typical Z-bend here, and grab it, and then turn 90 degrees. Be careful when you do bends like this because sometimes it will fatigue the metal. If it does, don't ever use it. Get a new piece of wire and start over. Our next step is to simply insert our wires. And as you can see, if you look straight on here, I bent it just a little bit of an acute angle towards the actual wire. So this isn't 90 degrees, it's more like 85 degrees. You'll see why in a second. 
simply go ahead and guide that wire into your hole. Use a little bit of rotation uh, motion to, to drive it through. All the tolerances should be just a touch tight on the wire. And the reason being is you don't want any slop. I'd rather have it be friction fit against the wire and have it be uh, loose. Now take your pliers and we're going to go ahead and grab the wire from the bottom. And with a little bit of a down pressure and a turn, get a nice sure fit and that's not going to go anywhere, especially when it goes through the linkage stoppers. We're going to repeat this process on the other side, and as you can see, our modified Z-bends are facing away from each other. If it faces toward the center, it's going to cause drag against the center pivot, and we don't want that. We want them pointing outwards and just a little bit on the acute side. A little twist, and we have it. Now, if everything's right, you should have full range of motion. Thrust vector assemblies really don't need a tremendous amount of motion to get a very good effect. So this is probably more than what you need, but what I didn't want to have to do is have you go into a programmable radio and dial all the way back. Lord willing, if everything works out, even a simple radio that you have, such as a DX5E, won't have to have any of the limits changed because of the linkages being exactly where they need to be. I want to say this next part very carefully. I'm going to be using a plastic geared 9 gram Hextronic Servo, or a TG9, and uh, I recommend if you're planning on using this for something with a big motor, um, or something that's greater than a Blue Wonder size motor, definitely don't go with this. Go with a 9 gram Metal Gear Servo. The better quality servo you use, the better the experience, especially if you're going to use this for FPV with a little board camera or a GoPro on the front. Uh, so I'm just going to use this for the example of showing it. Uh, a Metal Gear 9 gram servo is roughly the exact same dimensions so nothing's different. Simply guide our wire through. We'll slide that right down in like so. I left the dimension on this just a touch big so you can see you go, can go with a larger servo if you need to. A little deeper servo. And if this collides here, just go ahead and trim this back. You don't need to worry about this too much. Now one quick tip for you guys here is oftentimes our screwdrivers, they get old and they drop on the concrete a couple times. Sometimes they don't hold screws very well. One thing you can do is simply take a magnet, and if you don't know this, just rub your magnet in a strafing motion like this, and that will magnetize your screwdrivers again. They actually even sell screw, uh, screwdriver magnetizer, which is a magnet with a hole in the middle, and you just slide it through. But you can do this with any magnet, it doesn't have to be rare earth, but then when you put your screws on, they don't go anywhere. There we go. That's down. Once again, if you're gonna use anything like the Beef, anything for the, uh, like Vigan, use a nine gram Metal Gear high torque servo. Magnetic induction is wonderful. Basically what you'd wanna use for a tail pivot assembly because this is moving your whole entire motor. Next step is to center up our servo. I'm just gonna simply plug it in. If you don't have a servo center, that's fine. Just go ahead and plug it into your receiver and center it up. Reason being is if you forget this step and you have everything hooked up and cranked down, it can damage things if it goes from one extreme to another. I'm simply going to dial it in the middle. It's in the middle now. And I'm going to unplug it. Our next step is to install our linkage stoppers. Now to do this, I'm going to go from the center hole out. So here's our center hub. Here's one hole, second hole out. I'm going to go ahead and drill a little bit larger so our linkage stopper passes right on through. You don't want to go all the way out because the mechanical advantage is going to be too great and you're going to lose your resolution when you dial it down. There we are. Simply slide our linkage stoppers through, tighten them down, and put a drop of Loctite on them. It's actually better if you put your Loctite down on the screw threads and then screw it down over top. But we're going to go ahead and skip that step just for convenience in the video. Now remember with Loctite, red you're dead. If you use red Loctite, it's never coming off. Blue is a removable Loctite. It's the most friendly for the hobby. I'm going to go ahead and slide these through now on the journey to the servo. And now we have our servo centered up. We're going to go ahead and pop this down just like that. We can now secure this with a servo screw. And we're going to follow up two more screws for the linkage stoppers. Now one thing I like to do is I like to, as you can see, just turn it just ever so slightly forward I'm going to tighten down one. Make sure it's nice and tight and secure the way I like it. Now, I'm going to do something called preloading. You don't want to do this too aggressively because you don't want to bend your whole entire servo. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put a little bit of a rotational force against the firewall and the control horn, or the firewall and the servo arm. See that? Now, I'm going to go ahead and screw this down. 
And what I'm doing is I'm kind of preloading the servo just a little bit. You don't want to do it to the point where the servo is always humming. But what that'll do is I'll take away any slot that you may have between these linkage stoppers and your, your uh, pivot up here. Very, very solid. Now any slot we have is all based in the servo and the better the quality servo, the better dead area in the middle. This is actually amazingly good for a nine gram. Now, final step to make sure everything is good. I'm gonna plug it back into my servo tester. If you don't have a servo tester, simply use your, uh, your receiver. And there we are. I want to sincerely thank you for watching. Remember, these are at the store if you want them. There's also downloadable plans at the bottom of the article at flighttest.com. And uh, go build something.